The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. Chapter 4, Turkish Delight. But what are you? said the queen again. Are you a great overgrown dwarf that has cut off its beard? No, no, your majesty, said Edmund. I've never had a beard. I'm a boy. A boy? Do you mean you are a son of Adam? Edmund stood still and saying nothing. He was too confused by this time to understand what the question meant. I see you are an idiot, whatever else you may be. Answer me once and for all, or I shall lose my patience. Are you human? Oh, yes, your majesty. And how, pray tell, did you come to enter my dominions? Please, your majesty, I, I just came through a wardrobe. A wardrobe? What do you mean? Well, I opened a door and just found myself here, your majesty. Ha, huh, said the queen, speaking more to herself than to him. A door. A door from the world of men. I have heard such things. This may wreck all, but he's only one, and he's easily dealt with. And as she spoke these words, she rose from her seat and looked at Edmund full in the face, her eyes flaming at the same moment she raised her wand. Edmund felt for sure that she was going to do something dreadful, but he seemed unable to move. Just then, he gave himself up for lost. She appeared to have changed her mind. Oh, my poor child, how cold you look. Come sit with me here in the sledge, and I will put my mantle around you, and we will talk. Edmund did not like this arrangement at all, but he dared not disobey. He stepped onto the sledge and sat at her feet, and she put a fold of her fur mantle around him and tucked it well in. Perhaps something hot to drink? Should you like that? Well, ye yes, please, your majesty. Edmund said, whose teeth were chattering. The queen took from somewhere among her wrappings a very small bottle, which looked as if it were made of copper. Then, holding out her arm, she let one drop fall from it onto the snow beside the sledge. Edmund saw the drop for a second in mid-air, shining like a diamond. But the moment it touched the snow, there was a hissing sound, and there stood a jeweled cup full of something that steamed. The dwarf immediately took this and handed it to Edmund with a bow and a smile. Not a very nice smile. Edmund felt much better as he began to sip the hot drink. It was something he had never tasted before. Very sweet, and foamy, and creamy, and it warmed him right down to his toes. It is dull, son of Adam, to drink without eating. What would you like best to eat? Turkish delight, please, your majesty. The queen let another drop fall from her bottle on the snow, and instantly there appeared a round box tied with green silk ribbon, which, when opened, turned out to contain several pounds of the best Turkish delight. Each piece was sweet and light to the very center, and Edmund had never tasted anything more delicious. He was quite warm now and very comfortable. While he was eating, the queen kept asking him questions. At first, Edmund tried to remember that it was rude to speak with one's mouth full, but he soon forgot about this and thought only about trying to shovel down as much Turkish delight as he could. And the more he ate, the more he wanted to eat. And he never asked himself why the queen should be so inquisitive. She got him to tell her that he had one brother and two sisters, and that one of his sisters had already been in Narnia and had met a fawn there, and that no one except himself and his brother and his sisters knew anything about Narnia, she seemed especially interested in the fact that there were four of them and kept on coming back to it. Now, now you're sure there are just four of you, two sons of Adam and two daughters of Eve, neither more nor less. And Edmund, with his mouth full of Turkish delight, kept on saying, well, yeah, I told you that before, forgetting to call her your majesty. But she didn't seem to mind now. At last, the Turkish delight was all finished, and Eben was looking very hard at the empty box, wishing that she would ask him whether he would like some more. Probably the queen knew quite well that he was thinking, before she knew, though, Edmund did not, that this was enchanted Turkish delight, and that anyone who had once tasted it would want more and more of it, and would even, if they were allowed, go on eating till it killed themselves. But she did not offer him any more. Instead, she said to him, Son of Adam, I should 
so much like to meet your brother and your two sisters. Will you bring them to me? I'll try. Because if you did come again, bringing them with you, of course, I'd be able to give you some more Turkish delight. And I can't do it now. The magic will only work once. In my house, it would be another matter. Why can't we go to your house right now? When he had first got onto the sledge, he had been very afraid that she might drive away with him to some unknown place for which he would not be able to get back. But he had forgotten about that fear now. Oh, it's a lovely place, my house, and I'm sure you would like it. There are whole rooms full of Turkish delight. And what's more, I have no children of my own. I want a nice boy I could bring up as prince and who would be king of Narnia when I'm gone. And while he is prince, he would never, he would wear a gold crown in each Turkish delight all day long. And you are much the cleverest and handsomest young man I've ever met. And I think I would like to make you prince some day when you bring the others to visit me. Why not now? His face had become very red and his mouth and fingers were sticky. He did not look either clever or handsome, whatever the queen might say. Oh, but if I took you there now, I shouldn't see your brother and sisters. I very much want to know your charming relations. You are to be the prince and later on the king. That's understood, but you must have courtiers and nobles. I will make your brother a duke and your sisters duchesses. There's nothing special about them, said Edmund. And anyway, I can always bring them some other time. Ah, but once you're in my house, you might forget all about them. You would be enjoying yourself so much that you wouldn't want to go bother to go fetch them. No, you must go back onto your own country and come to me another day with them, you understand. It is no good coming without them. But I don't even know the way back to my own country. Well, that's easy. Do you see that lamp? She pointed with her wand and Edmund turned and saw the same lamp post under which Lucy had met the fawn. Straight on, beyond that is the way to the world of men. And now look the other way. Here she pointed in the opposite direction. And tell me if you can see two little hills rising above the tree. I think I can. Well, my house is between those two hills. So the next time you come, you only have to find the lamppost, look for those two hills and walk right through the wood until you reach my house. You'd better keep the river on your right when you get to it. But remember, you must bring the others with you. I might be very angry if you came alone. I'll do my best. And by the way, you needn't tell them about me. It would be fun to keep it a secret between us two, wouldn't it? Make it a surprise for them. Just bring them along the two hills. A clever boy will easily think of some excuse for doing that. And when you come to my house, you could say, uh, let's see who lives here or something like that. I'm sure that would be best. If your sister has met one of the fawns, she may have heard strange stories about me, nasty stories that might, her, might make her afraid to come and see me. Fawns will say anything, you know. And now, please, 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 couldn't I just have one more piece of Turkish delight to eat on my way home? No, no, said the queen with a laugh. You must wait until next time. While she spoke, she signaled to the dwarf to drive on, but as the sledge swept out of sight, the queen waved to Edmund, calling out, Next time! Next time! Don't forget! Come soon! Edmund was still staring after the sledge when he heard someone calling his name. And looking around, he saw Lucy coming towards him from another part of the wood. Oh, Edmund! So you got in too! Isn't it wonderful? And now... All right, said Edmund. I, I see you were right, and it is magic board robe after all. I'll say I'm sorry if you like, but where on earth have you been all this time? I've been looking for you everywhere. If I'd have known you'd gotten in, I'd have waited for you, said Lucy, who was too happy and excited to notice how snappishly Edmund spoke or how flushed or strange his face was. I've been having lunch with dear Mr. Tumnus, the fawn, and he's very well, and the white witch has done nothing to him for letting me go, so he thinks she can't have found out, and perhaps everything is going to be right after all. The White Witch? Who is that? said Edmund. Oh, she's a perfectly terrible person. She calls herself Queen of Narnia, 
though she has no right to be queen at all. And all the fawns and dryads and naiads and dwarfs and animals, at least all the good ones, simply hate her. And she can turn people into stone and do all kinds of horrible things. And she has made a magic so that it's always winter in Narnia. Always winter, but it never gets to be Christmas. And she drives about on a sledge drawn by reindeer and her wand in her hand and her crown on her head. Okay, Edmund was already feeling uncomfortable for having eaten too many sweets. And when he heard that the lady he had made friends with was a dangerous witch, he felt even more uncomfortable. But he wanted to taste that Turkish delight again more than he wanted anything else. Who told you all that stuff about the white witch? Oh, Mr. Tumnus the fawn. You can't always believe what a fawn says. Trying to sound like he knew far more about them than Lucy. Who said so? Asked Lucy. Well, everyone knows it. Ask anyone you like. But it's a pretty poor sport standing here in the snow. Let's go home. Yes, let's. Oh, and Edmund, I'm glad you got in. The others will have to believe in Narnia now that both of us have been there. What fun it will be. But Edmund secretly thought that it would not be as good fun for him as for her. He would have to admit to Luce that Lucy had been right before all the others, and he felt sure the others would all be on the side of the fawns and the animals. But he was already more than half on the side of the witch. He didn't know what he would say or how he would keep his secret once they were all talking about Narnia. By this time, they had walked a good way, and then suddenly they felt coats around them instead of branches. Next moment, they were both standing outside the wardrobe in the empty room. I say, said Lucy, you do look awful, Edmund. Don't you feel well? I'm all right, said Edmund, but this was not true. He was feeling very sick. Come on then, said Lucy, let's find the others. What a lot she will have, we will have to tell them and what wonderful adventures we should have now that we're all in it together.